Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, I see we have people filtering in nicely. So I think we can probably kick off, James. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. And hello, everyone. And behalf on, on behalf of Stop AIDS and Global Health Advocates, I'm delighted to welcome you to the launch of our new report series, Access Denied, What Happens When Big Pharma Is In The Driving Seat? Thank you very much for taking the time to join today's discussion. My name is uh, James Cole, and I am the Advocacy Manager at Stop AIDS. The report, this report series, written by Stop AIDS and Global Health Advocates, with the support of journalist Priti Putnik and a legal researcher, explores how a lack of transparency in the pharmaceutical industry and the EU has harmed public health outcomes. I would like to thank the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust for making this research possible. From the start of the pandemic, it was clear that COVID-19 was global and therefore demanded a global solution. Of course, the EU originally advocated for global solidarity in this pandemic response and for vaccines to be considered as global public goods. However, it largely abandoned its global solidarity approach and a lack of transparency meant that it was difficult to assess whether the EU was failing to meet their global objective until it was too late. Lives were lost and variants emerged, but contractual secrecy and industry interests were preserved. Three years on uh, today, the COVID-19 pandemic has officially caused the deaths of over 6 million people, disrupted global livelihoods, and continues to have a devastating impact on communities that had, don't have widespread access to health technologies. The pandemic has also re-emphasized the fundamental flaws in the global system for the research, development, and deployment of health um, technologies. As of June 2022, only still only 30% of WHO member states had reached WHO's targets of 70% vaccine coverage. And increasingly, we know that pharmaceutical corporations wielded enormous power during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet, how this power was exercised was often hidden from public view. With industry influence seeming to lead to some car crash decisions, uh, global health advocates and stop aids conducted two analyses to understand what happened, how it happened, and why it happened. Uh, the reports that we're really excited to launch are structured in two parts. In the first part, we set the scene, speaking to key actors and stakeholders who were directly involved or following the contract negotiations. In the second report, we ran a legal review of the contracts. Within this, we investigated the clauses and redactions in contracts, which we argued undermined public health in the name of private interests. We investigated the influence also that pharmaceutical industry exerted on decision making and outlined the consequences of these decisions. Together, the report's find findings informed a series of recommendations that decision makers can today implement to increase transparency and protect public health and democratic spaces. Increasingly, it's clear that we must learn from the mistakes in the response to COVID-19 to both strengthen current efforts against COVID and other health threats, but also to be better prepared for the next pandemic. And today, we of course are hosting this discussion under the backdrop of the European Parliament's COVID committee, preparing its final report on the lessons learned and the recommendations for the future. And two, uh, the European Council is publishing soon its legislative proposal for the revision um, of the EU general pharmaceuticals legislation. We hope the reports and today's discussion support these processes and the growing cross-sector calls for measures to ensure greater transparency, access and accountability. I will shortly uh, pass on to Teresa Bolden um, from Global Health Advocates and Molly Pugh-Jones from Stop Aids to present on the reports, our findings and our key recommendations. Uh, following this, we were really excited to host a panel discussion chaired by Rowan Dunn from Global Health Advocates with a panel of expert speakers which we're delighted to have joined us today. This includes MEP uh, Mark Batenga, 
Dimitri Inkiel, uh, EU Policy Officer at the MSF Access Campaign, and Dr. Olga Gugala, Senior Lecturer for Intellectual Property Law at Brunel University. Following this, there will then be an opportunity for questions on the reports and the recommendations. So uh, without further ado, I'm now delighted to hand over to Tarita, who will be presenting on the first report. Thank you, James, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tarita Baldan, and I'm the EU uh, Advocacy and Policy Officer at Global Health Advocates. For those who do not know us, uh, GHA is a French uh, nonprofit NGO advocating for policies and resources that effectively address health inequalities around the world. Today, I'll present to you uh, Report 1, exploring the EU decision-making around the EU contracts uh, negotiations. It gathers uh, inside perspectives from 12 stakeholders involved in the process, including members of parliament, uh, the commission, the negotiating team, industry representatives, and civil society, to name a few. Uh, it outlines the circumstances in which uh, COVID vaccines negotiations took place and explores uh, the level of influence uh, Big Pharma had over EU decision making. Report 1 uh, sets the scene for uh, Report 2, which is a legal review of the EU COVID-19 uh, vaccine contracts, which my colleague Molly from uh, SOP8 will present to you later. So a key consequence of the COVID pandemic has been the exacerbation of global systemic inequalities. Uh, almost three years uh, after the start of the pandemic, uh, there's widespread consensus that the current system has failed to achieve equitable access for all. This inequality has increased infections, uh, deaths, and spread of the new variants. We demonstrate in our reports uh, that commercial, economic, and geopolitical considerations led the global response to COVID rather than public uh, health considerations. And although the EU made several statements on the importance of global solidarity, these statements were not turned into concrete actions. Instead, they were translated into an every country for itself attitude which effectively led to a form of gatekeeping of uh, COVID health technologies. A striking example of this inconsistency can be seen with the access to COVID-19 stool accelerator, the act uh, The EU was uh, one of its founders and global leaders in supporting this initiative. And the act uh, COVAX facility uh, was created to act as a key purchasing agency for the whole world by pulling demand, uh, shaping market, and ensuring equitable distribution of vaccines. But COVAX largely felt short uh, in delivering this mandate, in part because rich countries uh, pursue bilateral negotiations with vaccine producers instead of using COVAX self-financing arm for the purchase of vaccines as expected. And while COVAX uh, faced problems purchasing vaccines, rich countries started to experience oversupply so they started to announce donations to poor countries. But according to the People's Vaccine Alliance, uh, by June 2022, less than half of the 2 point, uh, billion vaccine doses promised were actually delivered. Uh, that happened because of two main reasons. Uh, first, uh, the contracts signed, including those uh, signed by the commission, contain rigid clauses uh, on how doses uh, could be used and donated. Uh, and we will come back to, to this uh, during the presentation of report two. And the second reason was uh, because of liability. Even though uh, doses uh, could be donated, um, there were some liability issues and pharma companies uh, preferred uh, transfer these uh, liabilities to their customers, such as the EU. And, and these uh, liabilities were then transferred to your poorer countries when they were donated. And many uh, poor countries were not uh, able or willing uh, to take on these liabilities. So in a nutshell, uh, EU policy choices uh, to protect the current system fueled uh, global health inequalities between the global north and the global south, putting hundreds of millions of lives at risk. And these problems and consequences uh, can be explained by three features that illustrate the relationship between the EU and the pharma industry. Uh, first is the imbalance of power, which uh, leads to secrecy and to what some have termed as uh, threats. The power had by big pharma is something that has long been acknowledged. 
and came at the front front of the public discussions during the pandemic as questions were raised on the influence of private interest exercise of, on public decisions. Civil society has been uh, raising concerns about the role of the power of pharma industry even before this pandemic. Their influence has increased ever since the council issued a political recognition in 2016 that the current model of profits over people is problematic and the, asked the commission to review its system of incentives. And we're all looking forward to seeing the proposal for the revision of the basic pharmaceutical legislation, which should be out in mid-March, uh, which was aiming to address this. And data shows that uh, pharma lobby groups and companies, unlike civil society, has extensive access to EU decision-making during the pandemic. In fact, there were close to 100 meetings with the most senior commission officials between January 2020 and September 2022 not counting the informal communications and calls. In the first two years of the pandemic, uh, Big Pharma dedicated over 30 million to EU lobby spending. Uh, there were also questions regarding the people composing the negotiating team and possible conflict of interest. In fact, a few uh, negotiators for member states uh, have been found to have close ties with the pharma industry, including the leading Swedish negotiator uh, Richard Bergstrom. Until 2016, he was leading the Pharma Trade Association, FPA, and he now has his own consultancy with clients such as VIPS and Pharma, the Swiss and America Pharma Lobby Groups. Uh, pharma members include Pfizer, Sanofi, and Johnson & Johnson. All of them have signed COVID contracts with the EU. So this does leave us to question the possibility of conflict of interest. And the symbolism of power is even more evident in the controversy surrounding the publication of vaccine contracts. The full contracts had not been able, uh, not been made available. Uh, only heavily redacted versions uh, have been published by the Commission. It is noting, it's worth noting that Pfizer, uh, the EU biggest supplier with over two billion doses, has the most uh, redacted contracts it seems very likely that Pfizer had some control over these redactions. And this is quite concerning because we find ourselves in a situation where a corporate entity was able to dictate what a public institution such as the commission could or could not disclose to the citizens whose interest it was meant to represent. My colleague Molly will elaborate more on the contracts and redactions later. And uh, just last week, uh, the SMS gate uh, was making headlines again, with leaders of the COVID uh, committee agreeing to ask President von der Leyen to appear publicly in front of the panel to uh, explain her role in negotiating over text messages, the massive contract with Pfizer. Pfizer CEO, Arbut Bula, on the other hand, has been invited twice to appear in front of the committee, but has refused. And neither the European Ombudsman or the European Court of Auditors uh, have been able to obtain access to these important messages. Already in 20, uh, September 2020, several freedom of information requests were filed by CSOs uh, and members of the parliament to get access to information regarding the negotiations, including the agreed contracts. Corporate Europe Observatory shared with us uh, that for the request that they sent to get access to contracts, they quickly received a response, which was negative. While for the request to access other documents related to the negotiations, the commission didn't even reply. So this led them to submit a complaint to the European Ombudsman, which opened a negotiation that in turn led to the publication of heavily redacted contracts. But some uh, green MEPs were not satisfied and filed a complaint against the Commission to the European Court of Justice. Uh, after much back and forth, uh, some uh, members of Parliament uh, finally were granted access to these unredacted contracts, but under very strict circumstances. They were in a secure room, they had no cell phone and no right to advisor, and only 30 minutes counting in the clock. It was only in November last year uh, that the committee in charge of supervising and controlling EU budget, uh, the Cont Committee, received permission from DG Sante to review these agreements. And it has come to light uh, that the pharma industry 
was also able to manipulate certain processes to its advantage, uh, including the TRIPS negotiation. And despite being a leader in calling for global solidarity, the European Commission behind closed doors was actually uh, blocking the TRIPS proposal. Even though the European Parliament, a democratically elected body, uh, had called on the Commission uh, to support uh, the TRIPS. Some stakeholders uh, actually believe there is a connection between the EU's position on the TRIPS and uh, the negotiations of the vaccine contracts. And that is that the EU would defend uh, IP rights if it were able to secure vaccine doses for itself. If this claim was proved to be true, it would have serious consequences. But with so much secrecy surrounding these processes, it's, it's really hard to know. An investigation uh, published last year by Politico revealed that several member states, uh, including Belgium, received threatening calls from Pharma, uh, warning them that if they uh, re uh, supported the TRIPS uh, proposal, uh, Pharma would reconsider uh, local R&D investments. And just a few days ago, a story emerged about how BioNTech uh, was pressuring Twitter to censor global health activists criticizing them from not sharing vaccine technology with low-income countries. Uh, these reports um, examine key moments uh, during the pandemic. And we conclude that the European Commission uh, was in a position of weakness vis-a-vis -vis the pharma industry. In an emergency situation, uh, just like COVID, obtaining life-saving vaccines uh, was the EU's number one priority and the industry saw a clear opportunity there. Commercial interests were protected at the expense of global vaccine equity. With an accountable driver, the public was taken for a ride. Thank you for your attention. I'll now uh, give the floor to Molly uh, from Stop Aids, who will uh, present to you report two. Thank you, Teresa, um, and hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Molly. I'm COVID-19 Advocacy Officer at Stop AIDS, which is a UK-based HIV health and human rights advocacy network. So I'm going to speak to the second report in the series, which is a legal review of the COVID-19 contracts that were agreed between the European Commission and pharmaceutical companies. And um, it's an analysis of the clauses and reductions that we consider to have undermined public health in the name of profit. And I'd just like to note that the report was written by Stop Aids and Global Health Advocates with the support of a legal consultant. So if we go to the next slide, please. So first to outline um, the contents of the report, the report looks into the EU legal framework for information disclosure, focusing on provisions that are potentially relevant to COVID-19 vaccine contracts. It assesses how officials make decisions about redacting information, including on the basis of protecting commercial interests. Then the report reviews how the Commission redacted information during the COVID-19 pandemic, comparing the information contained in three redacted and unredacted vaccine contracts. And finally, the report analyzes legal and policy tools that can be used to challenge contractual secrecy when it undermines public health. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. So um, to take a deep dive into some of the content of the report, we first felt that it was important to um, understand the legal frameworks that underpin how the EU deals with information. So under the Treaty of the Functioning of the EU, EU institutions are required to conduct their work as openly as possible to promote good governance and ensure the participation of civil society. EU residents and citizens have a right of access to documents of the European Parliament, Council and Commission. Regulation 1049-2001 governs public access to Parliament, Council and Commission documents. Its purpose is to define disclosure principles and limits in such a way as to ensure the widest possible access to documents. The basic presumption is that all documents held by these institutions are public unless an exception applies. So exemptions that are potentially relevant to COVID-19 contracts include commercial interest, for which disclosure is prohibited if it would undermine the protection of commercial interests, including IP, um, intellectual property, unless there is an overriding public interest in disclosure. Um, and decision-making interests, so the disclosure of documents containing opinions for internal use as part of deliberations and preliminary consultations within the institution concerned, um, which is prohibited even after the decision has been made, if disclosure would seriously undermine the institution's decision-making process 
unless there is an overriding public interest in disclosure. So the report outlines these exemptions in greater detail. And for now, it's important just to note that what information gets disclosed is a decision that ultimately lies with the Commission. Um, and to get an exemption, the Commission must first identify if the disclosure of documents would undermine one of these interests. Uh, and then they'd need to evidence how um, access to the document would actually um, undermine this interest. And lastly, they would need to determine whether or not there is an overriding public interest justifying the discourse. So lastly, once the Commission determines not to close, uh, disclose documents in full or only redacted versions, individuals can challenge the Commission's decision by submitting a complaint to the European Ombudsman or to the Court of Justice of the European Union. So next, um, we considered how this um, framework applies in the context of COVID-19. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? Great, thank you. Um, so during COVID-19, the Commission limited the release of COVID-19 contracts, minutes and other documents. And in general, um, when they were made available, after consultation with vaccine manufacturers, these um, documents included the redaction of key information. Um, in its response to an application requesting access to these documents, the Commission provided um, the two aforementioned justifications to limit dis disclosure um, of information. So that is to protect commercial interests and to protect the procurement process, including decision making interests. Um, however, in 2021, the Italian public broadcaster Rai published unredacted uh, versions of three of the COVID-19 contracts. So this included the Commission's advanced purchase agreements with AstraZeneca, Pfizer and Moderna. The contracts provide a unique case study into the terms agreed to by the Commission during the COVID-19 crisis. Comparing the full contracts with redacted versions also helps to shine a light on the decision making of the Commission when it comes to applying exceptions and redacting agreements. Um, so we identified seven major categories of redactions, which includes information associated with deliveries, prices, IP rights, product description facilities and know-how, dose transfer, product safety, and legal frameworks. So I'm just gonna run through a couple of um, the findings that we list in the report, but this is not an exhaustive list um, and very much um, refer you back to that report for um, the full set of findings. Um, so on deliveries, we found that redactions were maintained even for historical data, including deliveries that had already occurred, which would otherwise seem to lack uh, commercial significance. Um, Additionally, some information about the choices made by the Commission itself was redacted. For example, in the Pfizer and AstraZeneca contract, the fact that the doses provided to the Commission would be split pro rata was redacted, but the same information was not redacted in the Moderna contract, and it was not clear on what basis the Commission redacted this decision. Um, information about pricing was redacted across all three of the contracts, notably um, in contrast to um, the European Commission, the United States disclosed COVID-19 vaccine prices in all of its contracts. Um, information about IP rights was inconsistently redacted by the Commission. Um, in the Pfizer contract, the Commission redacted that Pfizer held rights to the IP, but in the Moderna and AstraZeneca contracts, um, they disclosed that the companies retained the rights. Product characteristics, suppliers, and know-how were redacted in the Pfizer and Moderna contracts. And there were three notable redactions. Um, first, the Commission kept secret the vaccine specifications, which contain important information about manufacturing requirements that could be helpful to other vaccine producers. Um, second, the Commission redacted information about Moderna's obligation to produce initial doses in European sites. And third, the dose used in the mRNA vaccines was kept secret, even though this was already public knowledge. And lastly, the Commission redacted information about how vaccine doses could be transferred, donated and or resold in all three contracts. And these redactions were striking in part because they concealed the Commission's own rights to the doses that it had purchased. Um, and here industry was concerned about liability issues that um, Tarita mentioned earlier. For instance, if the doses purchased by the EU were donated to a third country, and an individual in that third country experienced adverse effects, um, who would be liable? Um, so making these comparisons between contracts made clear that the commission redacted a large volume of information that was relevant to public health. 
And it's important to consider why it is that they made decisions around the disclosure or reductions of these different information types and what impact this had on the EU, uh, EU pandemic response and also on global health. Um, so some key reflections in the report include that the Commission kept more information secret than other jurisdictions. For instance, pricing information was redacted by the Commission, but not by the United States. Um, the Commission also withheld information that was not related to the reasons it used to justify secrecy. For example, um, ascertaining contractor obligations was difficult in the redacted contracts because details around dates and time periods were redacted but it's unclear how this may have protected commercial interests or the procurement process. And it's also not clear on what basis information was kept secret about purely EU decisions, such as the decision to distribute doses on a pro rata basis. Um, one of the most striking features of the redactions was their arbitrariness. Information that was not redacted in one contract was redacted in another, suggesting that the Commission was not necessarily making an independent, consistent judgments on whether certain categories of information met the exemption um, and instead may have deferred to kind of preferences of the pharmaceutical um, companies. Lastly, across the three contracts analysed, the Pfizer contract was the most significantly redacted. Um, and this is consistent with prior analysis that finds that Pfizer exercised its power to extract significant concessions from governments, including the Commission, and it is also consistent with the findings of our first report. Um, so overall, given the lack of publicly available information, it's quite difficult to assess whether the Commission redacted more information on the pandemic contracts compared to other kinds of contracts, but it's clear that public health emergency allowed pharmaceutical corporations to wield significant power over the last couple of years. Um, and desperate for timely doses, governments may have agreed to terms that otherwise they wouldn't have, um, that may have been rejected, or um, the subject of at least kind of longer negotiations, including demands for more secrecy. So in light of these findings and those of the other report, we developed a set of key recommendations, and I'm going to now hand back over to Tarita, who's going to outline these. Thank you, Molly. So yes, uh, as Molly was saying, uh, the finding of both our reports uh, have informed a series of recommendations uh, that decision makers uh, could implement uh, to protect both uh, public health and democratic, uh, democratic spaces uh, by increasing uh, transparency, access, and accountability. So to ensure a key path uh, to medical countermeasure for all, uh, we have three uh, recommendations. Uh, first, that the upcoming uh, revision of the pharmaceutical legislation uh, should create a more competitive environment, should remove unnecessary barriers uh, to competition and address abuses of the system and unfair practices. In particular, uh, the EU should shorten uh, regulatory protection periods. Uh, second, um, when EU public funding is used uh, to develop biomedical countermeasures, it must be accompanied by access conditions to guarantee the availability, affordability, and accessibility of medical products uh, to all of those in need, uh, including in low and middle income countries. And third, uh, in the framework of the renewal of the EU Global Health Strategy, the EU and member states uh, must take concrete steps to ensure that medical countermeasures are available, accessible, and affordable to all. And in order to increase uh, transparency and avoid uh, corporate capture of EU uh, processes, we propose the following uh, recommendations. Uh, that first, any future and uh, preliminary negotiations that are held between the Commission and pharma companies before contracts are signed should be conducted in a fully open and transparency manner, using established processes rather than informal channels. Second, uh, in any future uh, official documents uh, bearing redaction should list the specific exceptions uh, under Article 4 of the transparency resolution uh, for each individual redaction rather than for the document as a whole. Uh, third, uh, the upcoming revision of the pharmaceutical legislation should include uh, specific measures uh, to guarantee transparency of R&D costs in its revised incentive uh, framework in line with the WTO recommendation. 
This lack of transparency um, has been acknowledged uh, by the Commission itself in its pharma strategy and in the inception uh, impact assessment as one of the key objectives of this revision. And some member states uh, also support this call. And fourth, uh, the EU should champion strong uh, transparency norms in the framework of the proposed uh, WHO uh, pandemic accord. And finally, our third set of recommendations aim to ensure that uh, public interest remains a priority in all of the agreements. And, and for that, uh, we propose that uh, first, the new European Health Emergency and Preparedness and Response Authority, so HERA, who is now in charge of preventing, detecting, and responding to health emergencies, abides by high standards of transparency and accountability that discloses timely, uh, in a timely manner, all documents related to this work. Um, HERA should ensure that there is meaningful consultation with uh, all relevant stakeholders, and while it should take into account uh, a wide variety of interests, it must ensure that public interest uh, remains the ultimate priority. Uh, second, uh, the burden of proof uh, demanded under Article 4 of the Transparency Regulation should be reversed, uh, with companies being required to prove that withheld information would actually damage their commercial interests. And lastly, in case of a conflict uh, arising between an exception provided under Article 4 of the Transparency Regulation and the overriding public interests, public interests should prevail. So the COVID uh, committee, it's uh, currently working on a report uh, with lessons learned from the pandemic and key recommendations for the future. We have seen that changes uh, are needed uh, to ensure that we do not re repeat the same mistakes again. And we hope to see uh, some concrete measures being put forward. So thank you again for listening to our presentations. Uh, I will now give the floor to my colleague Rowan, who will moderate a panel with our experts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tarita. So um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And yeah, once again, Tarita, thank you for this overview of our recommendations. So my name is Rowan Dunn. I'm the EU Advocacy Coordinator for Global Health Advocates' Brussels office. And uh, so I will be moderating this upcoming uh, panel discussion. A uh, couple of notes very quickly on housekeeping. Uh, so I would kindly ask our panelists to keep their camera uh, on during the panel discussion, uh, as well as during the Q&A, which will be following the panel discussion, and to please mute yourself if you uh, do not have the floor. Um, so on the panel today, I am joined by uh, three knowledgeable experts on the topics of transparency, accountability, and access. So if I may start with uh, Mr. Botenga. So uh, Mark Botenga is a left member of the European Parliament who belongs to the Workers' Party of Belgium. And uh, before his term as MEP, he was active in global health uh, activism. And uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, he was a, a very strong advocate and a campaigner in favor of transparency in regard to vaccine procurements, uh, the TRIPS waiver, uh, the lifting of uh, IP rights on health technologies in order to make vaccines a global public good, uh, notably via the No Profit on the Pandemic campaign. Our second panelist is Dr. Olga Gurgula, who is a senior lecturer in IP law at Brunel University in London. Uh, she has served as an expert consultant for international organizations, as well as governments and non-governmental non organizations. Uh, mainly in the fields of IP and access to medicines. Uh, Dr. Gurgura is the author of many articles, so as I mentioned, including on IP and public health, uh, strategic patenting by pharma companies, and compulsory licensing of trade secrets to enhance access to COVID-19 vaccines. And uh, last but absolutely not least, we are joined by uh, Dimitri uh, Einiko from Médecins Sans Frontières. And uh, Dimitri is a policy advisor, so of Médecins Sans Frontières Access Campaign and representative to the European Union. Uh, he co-coordinated the uh, policy department of the MSF Access Campaign in the first two years of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would like to thank you all for, uh, for being here today. It's, it's a pleasure to have you. I see we have a lot of people joining us online, which is fantastic. Um, so if, if I could start with you, uh, Mr. Botenga, 
Um, so as a member of the uh, European Parliament's COBE committee, uh, you've been hearing many different stakeholders' views on how the EU actually responded to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, would you share our view, which we present in a report, that there was, um, how to say, a certain inconsistency between the European Commission's words and its actions? And uh, a follow-up to that question, what role would you think the pharma industry played in shaping EU decision-making during the pandemic? Um, thank you. Thank you for, for the invitation and for the event and for the, the, two, the two studies. I think they're all uh, very, very um, to the point and timely. Uh, so congratulations, I think. Um, the report, um, and this is the first point which is important, contradicts actually the official narrative currently used by the European Commission, which is a narrative saying that the vaccine campaign and the vaccine strategy was by and large a success. Um, I think it's important for us to contradict that, to say, uh, listen, the, 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 from a global health perspective, you know, the EU vaccine strategy was actually not a success in that it impeded rapid vaccine access for a number of countries in the global south. Uh, because once you accept, and this was this was basically accepted at the very first, at the very start uh, of the negotiations, um, once you ex accept that intellectual property rights will stay uh, uniquely, completely, totally in the hands of uh, the companies, even when vaccines uh, are based, have been developed with a lot of technology that was funded and sometimes almost completely with public money. Uh, well, then you give the right to these companies to decide basically how much of the vaccine will be uh, produced, where it will be produced, uh, what price it will be sold eventually, and so on. So as soon as the EU accepted this and, and basically renounced to, to refuse to, to impose anything strong in, in that matter on pharmaceutical companies, it accepted that there was going to be shortages, short, shortages I can do this, um, and uh, many more than, than, than strictly necessary. I mean, it was going to be inevitable in the beginning, but I mean, that we were not going to have as many vaccines as quickly as possible as, as we could have had. And, and just to make it show, uh, to make it clear, there were alternatives. You know, the World Health Organization put up very quickly uh, a, a coronavirus COVID technology access pool, the CETA, with the idea of sharing technologies, intellectual property rights, in order to get into a more global, collaborative, cooperative uh, spirit in the development and the sharing of, the, of this, the, these health technologies. Uh, and even at later stages, you know, there was the, the TRIPS waiver debate, uh, you referred to it, uh, which was very important and where as well the European Commission specifically played a very negative role. While the European Parliament in the end, thanks to the campaign uh, and, and the pressure from different organizations, from people's movement and so on, this, this was really important. We succeeded actually in, uh, in tilting the balance inside Parliament, but the Commission stayed and continued to basically oppose uh, the TRIPS waiver. Now, the question is, why did the EU act this way? And this is where I fully share your message that unfortunately, uh, EU pharmaceutical policy throughout um, the years uh, has often been uh, very strongly influenced and sometimes driven by uh, big pharma interests and by profit interests. Now, this is generally expressed uh, in health documents by saying that we are worried about the competitiveness of the companies. Uh, and that becomes a euphemism to say that we are worried about the profits of the companies. Uh, and there's a connection here between what happened uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic and what happened before. Because even before, the EU saw these big pharma companies as partners. And they were even allowed uh, to decide sometimes on the allocation of public funds, uh, like in the case of the Innovative Medicines Initiative. But there's a fundamental difference of interest between, on the one hand, a private company attempting to make profits uh, and public authorities attempting to get the best drugs out there at the, uh, the most accessible way uh, for all. Uh, so unless we acknowledge this contradiction in interests very often and that we are, you know, we perhaps you need to negotiate, but it's a negotiation with another counterpart that has different interests. Unless we accept that, again, unless we acknowledge that, will be making the same mistakes over and over again. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for my first answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Botenga. Um, before turning to the next question, um, I just wanted to say that you are, of course, uh, anyone in the audience is, of course, welcome to, to send in questions. Uh, we will be taking some shortly uh, after the panel discussion. I see we're, we are receiving some uh, already. Uh, but yeah, again, once again, many thanks for your, uh, for your insight, Mr. Botenga. Uh, next, we'll be hearing from uh, Mr. Dimitri Einikov from Médecins Sans Frontières. 
Um, so yeah, if I can turn to you now. Um, so uh, we argue in our report that it was mainly, you know, commercial, economic, and also geopolitical considerations that sh helped uh, shape the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic, rather than actual global public health considerations. And that Big Pharma actually played quite a leading role in shaping uh, EU decision making. So I was wondering, how would you describe the, the power dynamics which played out between uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the European Commission, EU member states and the European Parliament? And how, in your opinion, did these dynamics uh, impact the global response to COVID-19? Yeah, also from my side, first of all, thank you for the invitation and for the excellent reports. It's, it's good research and it's good to document uh, what has happened so we can draw the right lessons learned, which is the end we all want to achieve. <clears throat> From our organization, we have indeed been, with MSF, been quite strongly involved in advocating on better global access throughout the pandemic uh, until today. And so we followed this closely. And so I will speak a bit from that, um, I, will, I will make a few additions to what has been said already, rather than, than repeat to what has been said. So first, I want to say that, you know, uh, there was a precedent to this inequity that we observed in 2005 with the H1N1 outbreak where double flu was being hoarded by, by Western countries. We could have known, and actually, you know, the, the, the important stakeholders, the commission, the council, et cetera, they all could have known or, or knew that this could happen. There was even a letter in March, 2020, which is just a few weeks after the outbreak in Italy, asking the commission to use public funding for non-exclusive licenses of COVID-19 vaccines, medicines, et cetera already at that time, which is super soon, actually, if you think about it in a pandemic, making the case that there's going to be scarcity, there's going to be problems, you need to address them. And if not, it's gross negligence. That's what the letter said. Now, after that, in May, indeed, you had this, you know, very generous comments about global public goods, the vaccines are going to be uh, global public good. But then I think something interesting happened that we sometimes overlook. And that's some comments that were made by the CEO of Sanofi that said, well, look, there's uh, generous support from BARDA. So we are actually thinking about giving priority access to the United States to our vaccines. At the same time, you saw the United States buying up the supply of remdesivir and Gilead, which was seen as a promising treatment. And this is where I think the factor of fear, the fear of missing out in a situation of scarcity was starting to drive the discussions and the negotiations and the power balance between the industry and, and the commission and the member states. You know, rather than tackling the scarcity, there was um, uh, going along with scarcity and making sure that at least we get our, our part of the pie, um, so to say. And this is really what enabled the industry, in my opinion, in terms of, um, you know, setting these provisions on liability, transparency, like the property rights and moving away from the from the commitment shoots were quite positive in May um, towards a vaccine strategy that in the end said, we will produce vaccines for Europe and we will export them to the rest of the world. And the only requirement we make to the industry is a moral commitment, which is worthless to be honest, a moral commitment to supply low and middle income countries. So there was no accountability there at all anymore to, to have a global pandemic response in that regard. And this was all before the TRIPS waiver was tabled in October. Already all the elements was there. There were already calls for sharing of, of, of technology. There were already calls for sharing of IP rights, etc. But they were starting to be ignored. And from that moment on, what I found quite pe peculiar is that the commission in particular, and after, afterwards also the member states, increasingly seem to self-identify with the interest of the industry. They repeated a lot of the narrative that IP is not a problem, that we're a better place, that it's not possible to produce vaccines outside Europe, etc. All these arguments are often repeated. Even the element that the EU is, is exporting vaccines, to some extent is questionable. The EU doesn't export vaccines. The EU allowed the exportation of vaccines, but it was companies who exported the vaccines according to their commercial interests. In the first vaccines were exported, the first batches were largely uh, exported from the EU to Canada, Australia, United States, etc., which had some level of supply at the detriment of lower middle income countries, which you could really see the commercial agenda driving really the exports. Um, so just to say that there's a problem there of, of taking distance from an industry which has completely different interests than what we expect from our government, governments, from the commission, et cetera, in terms of a public health response. And I think that distance actually should be, should be reinstalled to, them, to some extent and, and recreated. And I'm hopeful with a number of initiatives that are on the agenda right now that that, that can happen. Um, but, but that was certainly a major problem. And I think the interesting part is, as Mr. Botenga also outlined, is the position of parliament. Parliament was, um, the industry had far less leverage over parliament. They couldn't threaten with jobs or growth or uh, no access to vaccines. I mean, they could threaten that, but in the end, they're not the final decision makers. 
So Parliament took a decision to really look at all the arguments carefully and it had a far more nuanced response and positioning on, on a lot of these topics um, because the lobby machine the, the, didn't work. The threats wouldn't work or worked less effectively uh, compared to, com for example, the, the, the council or, or, or uh, the, the commission, which had real decision-making power when it comes to contracts and access to vaccines. Thank you very much. I think these, these uh, I think we'll, we'd all agree, these are very, very valid points, uh, Mr. Ainiku. Um, indeed, uh, one topic which which comes up quite uh, quite often, which I think you mentioned a few moments ago, is that of IP rights. Um, and for this, I'd like to move on to our our third speaker, who I think we'd all agree is a, is a true expert in the in the matter, Dr. Dr. Gogula. Um, so in our analysis, we found that um, you know policy makers really seem to believe that the current IP system is adequate and that it works well. And they uphold the industry belief, the industry's belief in many ways that uh, you know strong IP rules are necessary to protect in, in uh, innovation. And so we were just wondering, as an expert in, I, in IP law, what do you believe are other aspects which policymakers should take into consideration? Uh, thank you, Rowan, uh, very much for first of all for inviting me, uh, and uh, congratulations on this very comprehensive report. Um, answering your question, um, well, our system, IP system, was designed during normal times and uh, is supposed to provide a just balance between incentives to innovate and, well, in our case, to uh, pharma companies, well, on the other hand, to provide timely access to affordable medicines. And although, as we know, this system has been increasingly criticized for being inadequate to provide access to life-saving medicines even before the pandemic. So now we have to rely on this ineffective system during such an incredible emergency as the current pandemic. And we can now see this pandemic has revealed this that the system is not working. It is severely imbalanced, uh, prioritizing the protection of pharma companies' private interest and revealing our enormous dependence on private companies. And um, one of the key reasons for this is very strong IP protection embedded in the system. And we can see the significant lobby of pharmaceutical companies that even in such an uh, emergency uh, at international level, when millions of people were dying every day, we were not able to break the strong IP protection and implement the IP waiver, which could have saved uh, millions of lives. And the first uh, report uh, discusses this uh, problem. Uh, 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 you discuss patents that provide protection to vaccines. I would also add a significant reliance of pharma companies on trade secrets uh, because vaccines are complex technologies. They are protected not only by patents, but also by trade secrets. And um, while we have some mechanism in IP law that could potentially help with accessing uh, patent protected products uh, without the patent owner's uh, permission in the form of uh, compulsory licensing, there is no such mechanism uh, in IP law. Uh, that uh, would help with uh, trade secrets. So even if uh, there is a potential uh, political will on the part of governments to uh, implement involuntary uh, technology transfer, we wouldn't be able to do that because the, the, the legislation is, uh, is inadequate. So the current system of medical innovation and access is completely inadequate for such emergencies as the current pandemic. And uh, we essentially... Uh, a government are completely dependent um, and uh, at the mercy of international cooperation. So we must reconsider the system. We need to be prepared for uh, future pandemics better. Fantastic, thank you. These are really some, some very, very interesting uh, insights. Um, if I can just come back to you for a moment, uh, Mr. Botenga. So in our previous session, my colleague Jurita presented an overview of uh, recommendations. So developed by both uh, Global Health Advocates and, uh, and Stop AIDS. So from your point of view, which would you say, uh, which recommendations would you say uh, are the most relevant at this point and, and why? Um, thank you. I like the, the most concrete ones the best because they're, uh, they're, they're the easiest, let's say, for us also to defend and to try to get into the, the final conclusions of, um, 
of our of, of the report so that will be a, a, a fight in any case because as you know not everyone in parliament uh, agrees uh, with, with these recommendations unfortunately or not yet um, so let me first pick up maybe the absolute necessity to shorten the regulatory protection periods. I think this is really important. There's a push from industry to strengthen IP. Uh, it's a continuous push, be it by supplementary protection certificates, be it by extending the, the, the protection of other um, offered by other tools. So I think this is really important. We have a strong argument as well regarding the innovation model. Um, the strengthening of IP has not led to a better innovation model. Uh, if you look at the, 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 the amount of, of new, really innovative medicines we get for public money and you compare it to, uh, let's say, the 50s, it's not like you can claim that intellectual property right has been this uh, great at, at, at guaranteeing an innovation. Um, moreover, companies like to claim that they need these big profits they're making in order to reinvest in research and development. Uh, now, we all know that profits very often go somewhere else, be it in advertisement, be it in dividends, uh, share buybacks, and so on. So I also think that making public funding conditional on public access clauses is absolutely fundamental. You're using public money, put the conditions. Um, I'm not going to comment on transparency. I'm very much in favor. I think the current scandal ongoing in the European Parliament proves that we need as much transparency as we can get. And unfortunately, uh, I don't think HERA is currently as transparent and as accountable as it should be. Uh, far from that. Uh, so we need to do this. And it's all the more important because unfortunately, the European Commission is using the model of negotiations with Big Pharma as a model for other negotiations. For example, the joint purchases uh, on energy now, uh, they're kind of taking the model of the vaccine purchase negotiations uh, as an example, which is obviously not the way we want to go. So that's important. And maybe if you allow me, I'll try to add one, uh, which I would have, uh, which, uh, which I think is important. Because it's been lined out also, uh, I think, by by, by during Tianical and, and the, the, the leverage these companies had uh, is also linked to the fact that they very often have uh, almost a monopoly uh, or if not a monopoly on drug uh, development or on drug production. And so I do think, and this is a report that has been uh, presented to the scientific panel of the parliament recently, that we need a public infrastructure. We need to start thinking about a public infrastructure for research development, perhaps even the production of certain essential medicines uh, in order to make sure that uh, you know the opposite happens. You said what happens when uh, big pharma is, 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 is uh, making the law, is driving. Well, let's make sure that public uh, the public interest public health is uh controlling is, is setting the, the the agenda and therefore i think considering uh and and developing a public health infrastructure uh as in really public or non-for-profit biotech initiatives whatsoever i think that could be a really good uh, recommendation i also would like to see in the COVID report thank you very much Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Botenka, for these uh, very interesting, ex uh, very interesting insights. Uh, duly noted for your for your last recommendation. Um, and uh, now, if if I can move on to you, uh, back to you again, uh, Mr. Einuku, with a similar question: uh, Which recommendations, in, in your opinion, are the most timely? In perhaps just a, a couple of sentences. Okay. Well, there are three that really stand out for me. One, and, and I will briefly discuss them. The first one is with regards to the regulation on access to to documents of the EU. I think there's really indeed a problem there. You know, in a way, it's it's kind of almost ironic that that you know there, there needs to be an override in public interest, but in the regulation, it's not defined. So it's the Commission itself that has access to documents that defines whether there is an override in public interest or not. We as the public don't know if we have an override in public interest because it's not defined. So there's a problem there that that regulation needs to be addressed. Now that's specifically on on the one of trans on, on access to documents. The other two are more generally about transparency in your in the pharmaceutical system on prices, RMD, etc. We really need an implementation of the WHO transparency resolution of 2019, which has been agreed upon, but nobody implements it in full. The second one is on access conditions to research and development for the reasons that Mr. Potenga has has described. But on that point, it's true that there are some. I mean, there is some movement in the European Commission with the pharmaceutical strategy. But it's very much led by the health department when it comes to market approval. A lot of the leverage is not there. It's much earlier in the development process. It's the research and development uh, uh, department. It's the economic growth department, the trade department, etc. They have a lot of leverage over some of these files. But 
unfortunately, it's all tasked upon the health department to solve of some of the, the, the imbalances of power at the very end when the product enters the market, which is too late. So we really need to have buy-in and a shift of, of, of positioning across the commission, in my opinion. And this is a bit going back to the points that have been raised earlier, that the industry is seen as a partner because of historic and economic reasons. And we really need to see this as an industry that needs to be properly regulated in the public interest. Thank you very much again, uh, ex excellent insights. And um, yeah, if, if I can come back uh, to you with Dr. Gogula. So in our analysis of the uh, EU framework for access documents, uh, what we found is that it, it can be quite hard to challenge the redactions uh, because the applicant requesting access is the one who needs to provide the specific uh, circumstances for, the, for disclosure without at the same time having access to the actual documents. Um, so one of our recommendations is to uh, reverse this, this burden of proof. Um, so basically European Commission or third parties requesting uh, documents to be redacted would need to show exactly how access to that document could specifically and actually undermine the interest protected by that, uh, by that exception. Um, what do you think of this recommendation? Well, I completely agree. It's difficult not to agree with this recommendation. Uh, so the basic presumption is that all documents held by European institutions are public unless uh, there is an exception and commercial interest is an exception, right? Uh, so unless there is overriding public interest. And it, it was very interesting to see uh, that the report essentially well, uh, analyzing the decision, court decisions uh, revealed that uh, the courts have placed the burden of identifying the specific circumstances that establish the public interest on applicants requesting access. And this is really a heavy burden because they do not have access to the documents. And of course, it is difficult to provide such evidence, such specific evidence. So I completely agree the burden must be on the public body who is in possession of the documents and have the possibility to evaluate such interests. Moreover, I think that the reliance on the most uh, important principles of government bodies, such as openness and transparency, as well as accountability for spending uh, public money, especially in times of emergencies, such as the current pandemic, uh, should be enough to satisfy uh, this burden for the applicant. So yes, absolutely, it is the government authority that must conduct the balancing exercise when considering uh, whether to provide access to a specific document or not. Thank you very much. Uh, very, 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 very interesting. Um, I think we can now move uh, to the uh, Q&A session. I see we already have some interesting answers coming in from the audience and uh, a couple of different channels. Um, I see we have a question here uh, for you, Mr. Mr. Butanga. Uh, so the question is, these are quite relevant and timely recommendations and having the support of the European Parliament is absolutely crucial to make them a reality. Uh, do you foresee that the Parliament as a whole will support them and what can be uh, done to ensure they are taken forward? Um, I think this is, and Parliament is a political entity, let's make this clear. So whatever happens in Parliament has to do with, uh, with pressure, with uh, mobilization uh, from civil society, from people. Uh, because I also think, I mean, when we started um, discussing intellectual property rights and, for example, the TRIPS waiver in Parliament, uh, there was no majority for them, uh, for it at all. Uh, it was even like people were looking at us that were like, what are you talking about? What, what, why is this going to be an issue? Although it was foreseeable. Um, but uh, over time, because of the mobilizations, because of the, the pressure that was exerted by, uh, as I said, civil society organizations, um, some MEPs got better information, so that was important. Uh, some MEPs were like, okay, no, indeed, uh, there is a, a public health uh, emergency. We need to act, and if this is an obstacle, then we need to, 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 to take away the obstacle. Um, so I'm always optimistic, I've always been, um, and I think we can uh, include these, but it will require uh, pressure and it will require uh, mobilization, advocacy, uh, on behalf of, of, of course, of ourselves, uh, of the, 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 the members of parliament, the politicians that are uh, supporting this cause, but on the other hand, also and especially from, from civil society organizations and uh, the global, let's say, the global health movement as such. Okay, thank you. 
Um, we have another question uh, come in just now. I'm afraid it doesn't say who it is for, so I'm guessing it's probably either uh, for you, Mr. Einikol, or for Dr. Gurgula. Uh, so contractual secrecy is a collective action problem. Governments keep some information secrets uh, because they believe that they are being offered better terms that might not be available to them. If the information was known to others, such as a price, such as a price discount, for example, uh, what would happen if everyone was uh, required to publish contractual information? And uh, do you see the pandemic accord, the, the pandemic accord, as an opportunity to promote contractual uh, secrecy? I'm not sure who wants to to take this. I see you've unmuted yourself, Dr. Gorgola. Um, it's a very good question, uh, and we can see the same issue, uh, the same problem uh, we've uh, identified in, in the UK as well, when UK government uh, relied on uh, trade secret law uh, and reducted all the uh, con important contractual uh, elements uh, when they were procuring uh, contracts. Uh, relying also on commercial uh, interests uh, and that we need to understand that this has impacted not only the negotiations here in, in the UK but also um, how the information, the lack of information in other countries uh, affected the negotiations in their, uh, in their jurisdictions. Uh, ending up with developing countries paying very high price for for vaccines higher than uh, in the UK in the European Union. So uh, I think that the idea of disclosing information, such information as well, it's not a commercial, uh, it's not a manufacturing process that uh, the company should uh, protect, right? So the price of uh, of a vaccine should not be uh, a secret. And this will help both inside the country uh, in terms of how the government spends uh, the public fund, but also it will help other countries to negotiate fair pricing. And I think that uh, in, in your reports, uh, this is something that uh, has been highlighted uh, very clearly. Can I, no, can I answer this question as well? <clears throat> of course, Appreciate. go ahead. Well, the only reason that these prices are secret, as uh, Dr. Gurgula briefly mentioned as well, is because it's the interest of industry. There's there's no public interest in keeping the secrets. The, the public uh, sector is not asking for this, it's the private sector. And I've done a bit of research about the prices of medicines, the real net prices of medicines in Europe. And I came across that some of the prices were highest in Portugal and Poland, and they were the least expensive in the UK and Switzerland, which doesn't make any sense if you think about GDP per capita. It should be the other way around. And this shows you exactly why there is no transparency, because it enables unfair pricing practices. So our opinion is quite clearly that you know transparency will enable more fair negotiations, fair prices, uh, fair conditions, etc., to be negotiated um, in, in the interest within Europe, but largely within the interest on a global level as well beyond Europe. Thank you very much. Um, yes, it's, it's true that it is, it is one thing which we talk about in the reports is that uh, unlike uh, unlike in, in the EU, so for example, if you look at the COVID-19 contracts, which were signed uh, with the American government or with the British government, the prices there were actually public. Um, and it doesn't seem to have, uh, you know, damaged the industry's commercial interest in, in those countries. Um, I see we have another question uh, that has come in. Uh, so for Tarita on the, uh, on the first report, which you presented um, regarding who actually carries carries out the contract negotiations and uh, whether the information is public. Uh, hi, Ron. So thank you. Uh, the, the, so who carries out the negotiations? Uh, the commission, uh, together with a joint uh, negotiating team, carries out the negotiations for the vaccines uh, with the suppliers. So the members of the negotiating team are appointed by your steering committee. Uh, they are representative of uh, seven member states. So France, uh, Germany, Italy, Poland, Spain, Sweden, and the Netherlands. So Italy, Netherlands, and Spain, they have uh, confirmed their envoy to journalists, but the commission has uh, declined to share the list of the negotiators officially. Uh, in, in fact, uh, one of the documents uh, that were requested in the freedom of information request uh, that was required for, for the commission is it was indeed to disclose this uh, negotiating team uh, list. Um, and the 
ombudsman investigation uh, that led to the heavily redacted contracts uh, being disclosed also came together with a promise from the commission to consider making over 300 documents related to the negotiations available. So after this promise, uh, the inquiry was closed, uh, but promises were unfulfilled because we still don't have access to most of these documents, uh, even redacted versions of them. Uh, so the ombudsman reopened uh, this investigation and asked the commission uh, to share how they have fulfilled their promise to review uh, these documents uh, and gave them mid to January as a deadline. Uh, we have got contact uh, Corporate Europe's observatory just uh, before finalizing the reports. And as of the beginning of this month, uh, they have received no, no update on, on this matter. Thank you very much, Tarita. Um, we have uh, one more question that has come in for Mr. Botanga. I, I realize that you have to go in a couple of minutes. So I hope you can take one final question. Um, it, it's a very, shall we say, uh, it, it's very, um, you know, linked to the current events happening here in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, are you confident uh, with the fact that the Pfizer uh, CEO will finally agree to, agree to uh, meet MEPs? So probably I'm guessing within the COVID committee. Uh, yes, I get that question because uh, I said I was always optimistic, but uh, no, on this one I am not. Uh, he has uh, shown an absolute um, lack of respect for uh, transparency in general uh, and lack of, uh, of, of respect also for uh, the European Parliament. Uh, the bigger issue here, I think, is, and this has been pointed out by the EU Court of Auditors and by the Ombudsman, is obviously that he doesn't need to because he's got a direct link to the chairwoman of the European Commission. Uh, even through uh, WhatsApp messages, it's also mentioned in, in the report, uh, which is an absolute scandal from uh, a transparency and a democratic accountability perspective. Um, you cannot have this uh, kind of negotiations being dealt, uh, even small part of it, because a uh, uh, spokesperson of Pfizer told us, yes, but obviously these, co these negotiations are too complex to be dealt with uh, through WhatsApp message. So don't worry, there's nothing to worry about. But obviously we all know that these messages, you know, that there might be a small clause in the messages or it's a friendly message that, that does mix up interest. You know, there's a conflict of interest there, which is very clear. Um, so no, I am not confident. Uh, I am hopeful though, and in, in order to end on an optimist, optimistic note, um, that this entire scandal we currently have, which does show that there's a big problem with uh, the, the culture, let's say of money, uh, within the European institutions and the European Parliament, uh, that we can use this hopefully as leverage to burst open the bubble a little bit and, and to make sure that we get the transparency and the democratic accountability that we do deserve and that people deserve when uh, vaccines are bought with their money. Absolutely. I think that's, that's a very uh, it's a very strong note uh, to end on on your side. Uh, I understand that you have to leave now, uh, but uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it, was, it was a pleasure to have you and to have your insights. Um, we have one, I think we have time for one final question, uh, which is for Mr. Uh, Mr. Einiko. Uh, so why was the 2019 World Health Assembly resolution on transparency in the pharmaceutical relations with governments unanimously agreed upon at the WHO only a few months before COVID-19 started, completely disregarded and ignored later on? <laughs> it's a good question. I, th I think it's better to ask the, your your local government and or your national government basically why that's the case than, than me. <clears throat> One caveat: it was it was adopted with with three three countries that opted out, and it was Germany, Hungary, and I think the UK actually opted out from from uh, you know binding themselves to these commitments. But um, well, actually, I say binding, but it's actually a non-binding resolution. So it's it's a more general commitment to to work towards these goals. I think there was one or two countries at least that that made some progress. Italy and France, in particular, there was some progress. But on a more general level, it's just you know when it comes the the, the imbalances in power that we discuss here today are exactly the problem, right? When it comes to implementing commitments about transparency, etc. This is when you get the pushback when it has to be put into a particular law that has to go to government, has to go through parliament, has to be voted on, etc. And this is where the lobby machine kicks in and things start to get very complicated to move forward. In addition, the second factor, maybe an even more important factor, is again this fear of um, fear of missing out, if I would put it this way. 
countries are <clears throat> still hesitant to move forward to transparency, uh, you know, kind of avoiding the, the confidentiality clauses and then facing a higher price. They're, they're, they're afraid of the repercussion that it could, could ha we have on them and their access to, to the products that they need. And this is where there's really a need to build mutual trust in a way, because if all countries or, or many countries, let's say in the European Union or in even on a more global level, start to work together and have this commitment already and start to implement it at the same time, you take away this fear because this is when the potential negative consequences of being the only one that's being transparent is taken away. So you need to build on this trust and you really need to work on a concrete frame of implementation, in my opinion, to really move uh, move it up significantly, if, even if there are you know, good steps taken in a number of countries. Fantastic. Thank you for the, for your answer. Uh, I think to, just to bounce back very briefly on, on the question of trust, um, as as we have seen, uh, you know, especially during the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, public has been losing trust in in governments and in the vaccines as well. We are seeing more and more uh, vaccine hesitancy, uh, which is certainly, in my opinion, not being helped by the fact that you know there's been so much secrecy about the around the around the the contract negotiations and everything which has happened later on. Uh, Pfizer refusing to answer questions. It's uh, it's it's certainly not helping things. Um, but uh, thank you very much to everyone for uh, submitting your questions um, and uh, a very special thank you to our three panelists uh, for making yourselves available today to share your insights and your expertise. Uh, I think we can all agree it was a, a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I will now hand over uh, back to James Cole from uh, Stop Aids for a, a couple of closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rowan, and thank you so much, Mr. Pratenga, Mr. Einenkill, and Dr. Kugola, um, for a really insightful um, discussion and uh, reflections as well, team. Only got a few minutes, but I think we could spend many, many hours more discussing uh, the insights that you shared today as well, team. But just for a few short reflections, I think the panel highlighted how we did have an alternative whether that was a COVID-19 technology access pool, whether that was the TRIPS raver, or just fighting for transparency, we could have avoided some really car crash decisions and expanded vaccine access globally as well. And we also knew our history. This wasn't the first pandemic. It won't be the last pandemic. And we need to learn whether it's from HIV, whether it's from COVID, about the policy and legal tools we can use to prioritize public health. The discussions also highlighted uh, the cross international challenges that we're all facing uh, for myself being in one of the free countries that uh, actually uh, didn't endorse the transparency resolution um, being the UK. Um, we do see too clearly in the UK as well, the level of pharmaceutical influence and the fundamental lack of transparency and the reports that we're launching today align really well um, to the other pieces of research the stop aid to be um, reporting on over the coming months as well too. And, and for Mr. Potenga's point, completely agree on the need for civil society and uh, community mobilization and advocacy. And hopefully the reports will feed in to support that work going forward. Um, so ultimately, um, the reports we're launching today have highlighted how a lack of transparency and industry influence meant it was difficult to assess whether the commission was failing to meet its objective to promote global vaccine access until it was too late. Lives were lost, variants emerged, um, but contractual secrecy was um, preserved. Um, and we found uh, that pharmaceutical companies steered the direction of the EU's COVID-19 response. This was despite there being huge public funding for the development of COVID-19 health technologies. The same mistakes cannot be repeated again. Ensuring access, transparency and accountability will be fundamental for bettering the Commission's pandemic response. We hope our research and the key recommendations put forward today will support decision makers to take the necessary action to promote transparency and protect public health and democratic spaces. The reports are now available on both Stop Aids and Global Health Advocates websites. Um, and we uh, officially released uh, tomorrow. Uh, please do read uh, the full reports and share across your colleagues and networks. Um, and if you can turn to the next uh, slide um, that has myself and Rowan's uh, details, 
um, please do reach out to us if you had any questions about the reports or if you wanted to discuss the recommendations further, including for any requests from journalists. And we very much look forward to continuing to work with colleagues to drive forward the report series recommendations. So I would like to close um, by thanking everyone who joined today's webinar. And of course, again, our expert panelists of MEP Mark Batenga, Dimitri Inikil, and Dr. Ogu Gola. I'd also like to thank again um, journalist Priti Pupnik um, and a legal researcher for supporting writing the report and everyone who was interviewed um, by us as well. And finally, I'd like to thank again the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust for making this research possible. And thanks again for everyone for joining uh, today. Thank you.